Welcome to Classic Game Room. You know what they say, don't judge a book by its cover unless that cover is the artwork on Magmax. Which is remarkable. The game's not as good as its cover, but it's still good. And you want to own it solely because it has a robot with a lightsaber fighting Mecha Monster Zero on the NES. I have a poster of this on the wall. I feel like the only way to properly review Magmax is in front of the Magmax poster, which is possibly the greatest video game cover art of all time. Just look at it. We've got a robot with a lightsaber fighting Mecha Monster Zero while UFOs and robot dinosaurs watch. I hope the future is just like this next week. I really can't get enough of the Magmax soundtrack, which sounds like it's permanently stuck in the R zone and pretty cool because of it. This is a 1988 release for the Nintendo Entertainment System. I found it for five bucks and it's worth every penny for he shall forever be known as Magmax, hero of the future who shoots things with his foot lasers. But first you have to find legs. Oh, look, there they are, quick! Magmax, equip your legs! Foot lasers activated. Magmax is great, get the camera! Camera activated. I think it goes without saying, Magmax deserves a place on the shelf in between Truxton and Cosmic Carnage. But wait, there's more. Laser vacuum activated. Is there anything Magmax can't do? Magmax can't read. How many robots shoot enemies with their feet? That's why Magmax is amazing. I'm shooting them with my feet. Foot lasers. No, my legs! You've blown off Magmax's legs! He just sort of scoots around now. It's, it's almost sad. Oh, oh, there's new legs! I. Do I need to mention what song should be playing the moment that Mag Max gets new legs? I don't, because you already know where I'm going with that one. Mag Max has legs. Mag Max knows how to use them. I think for this sequel they should have Mag Max team up with Mad Max. Now, now that would be a game. And a cultural phenomenon. As if this game isn't already a cultural phenomenon. Just look at it. It's like Saycross mixed with Voltron and a generic 1980s spaceship shooter. Who will you be next year for Halloween? Mag Max. Just when you think it can't get any better, Mag Max transforms into a walking snow speeder. This one is so weird. Why have I never heard of it before? I mean, aside from the poster on the wall, which is why I bought it. I uh, usually don't have to buy games anymore, but I was out just in a game store and I saw the game and I'm like, oh yeah, I have the poster for that game. Clearly I should own the game and it's not as good as the poster, but it's still pretty good. It has robot seahorses. Mag Max has robot seahorses. Can you ever have enough robot seahorses in your life? You can't. If your answer is yes, you could easily have enough robot seahorses. Just stop watching. You're not worthy of Magmax. All right, here's the part where Magmax gets his laser camera. Where it looks like he's shooting people with a Hasselblad. Which would be the most expensive weapon imaginable. Magmax shoots enemies with a laser hustle blood, and Magmax can only be destroyed after he loses his legs and torso. It's a remarkable game. I mean, it's, it's kind of not, but it, it's, it also is at the exact same time. Like, how could you possibly go wrong with this one? Sure, it gets repetitive, but if you find it repetitive, that's your fault. No! Oh, somebody crashed into Magmax's head! Thankfully, there's another one here. Replacement parts. Magmax is under warranty. Oh no! I think I was just shot by a walking toaster oven. I don't know what else to say here. I love this game, but it's not a great game. It's Magmax. Each game is like a half hour of this. 
Oh no, lava! Your lava doesn't scare me. But I am mildly concerned. Alright. Now I have new legs. Which is good, because... I get a sick thrill out of shooting things with foot lasers. You can shift between the upper and lower level. I'm not sure there's much difference between the two, except it's Magmax. Magmax can do no wrong, which means I must now reorganize my shelves. I laugh at your feeble attempts to destroy Magmax. Oh no! Now I fight Monster Zero! Garfield caught in the act. You're not worthy to share shelf space with Truxton and Cosmic Carnage. Make way for Magmax! Looking for new legs. Does anyone have legs for Magmax? Oh look, the ocean! Oh, that's nice, it's refreshing. Magmax likes refreshing. And I love Magmax, it's just so insanely weird. It's kind of fun, it's a really simple game, just extremely likable. And your life isn't complete unless you own Magmax. Unless Magmax owns you first. Boss battle. Oh no! Magmax, don't lose your head! <gasps> Thankfully, he's still got a snow speeder. And legs. There's something really threatening about robot seahorses. There's also something threatening about a cave that opens up into the ocean while being chased by one of the things from Xevious. No! No, I have been destroyed almost! But not quite. Ah, Magmax has returned to his almost former glory. Ow! You evil creatures from another dimension! How dare you shoot Magmax's legs and torso? Like, are, these are the weirdest enemy designs. Like, it's like somebody raided a Home Depot. I feel like they missed the obvious opportunity to add a power-up sound when he fully roboticizes himself, but, you know. You can do that just by yourself. Power-up! Magma- Oh, you shot my legs! Now I'm scooting. I am like Scoot Max. I will scoot my way to victory. This game is now a thing. Children far and wide will say, I want to play Magmax instead of Minecraft or whatever kids play now. Because this is obviously better. Look at it. It's Magmax. Whoa, whoa! Stop shooting at me. We're friends, but we're not. We're actually mortal enemies. Time to die. There you go. I would say I put my foot up his ass, except I'm currently without feet. Magmax likes to also use his laser chainsaw to cut through enemies. Oh, well. Oh, there's legs! Quick, get legs! Yes! Bump the camera. Oh, I get so excited when playing Magmax. Hi. Adjusting the camera. I hit the camera. Got too excited. Shoot my legs! They're all I have! Until I get new ones. Game over, Mad Max. <laughs> no! Mag Max is vulnerable. And also somewhat irritating. Don't make Mag Max mad. You wouldn't like Mad Max when he's mad. Mag 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 this is very much a tongue twister when you combine Mag Max with Mad Max. Only one of them was in the Road Warrior, or Braveheart. The other one has robot legs and shoots things from his feet. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Ikari Warriors 2, the bizarre sequel to Ikari Warriors that I beat 20 some years ago, and it's still fun and weird today. This brings back so many memories. I had this game as a kid and absolutely loved it. 
Revisiting it many, many years later reminds me that yes, I was correct. This game is awesome. It's the sequel to Ikari Warriors, Ikari Warriors 2 Victory Road, and playing this game will bring you victory. Because it's great. It's also kind of weird, and in a way it feels unfinished, but that just adds to the charm. I love the sound effects in Ikari Warriors 2. The synthesized voice speech was not something that you normally heard in NES games back in the day. Who can forget the beginning of each level? Come on, let's play. Come on, let's Love that, but I totally forgot about the weapon upgrading system and the stores in Ikari Warriors where you can buy items. It makes it a much easier game than the first one. The music is kind of weird, but I like the visual style and color palette, which is downright trippy. You have four main weapons that you can choose from and two sub-weapons in Ikari Warriors 2. The boomerang is the one you'll use 95% of the time. It's like the perfect weapon. It destroys everything and comes right back to you. Occasionally, you'll want to use the bazooka. Don't even worry about the other two. I love that the store is in the back room of a bar. It just seems so sketchy. I frequent the store even if I don't need anything. Tell me that's not the most rewarding scream in video game history. It's great! Blah! It's a bit of an odd game and an unusual classic on the NES. I think it's the perfect sequel to Akari Warriors, personally. The controls are really good. You can fire in the direction that you're running, or you can hold down the fire button and strafe. So that makes it really playable. Also, you've got grenades and landmines. You'll probably never use the landmines. Akari Warriors 2 is is pretty unbalanced. For the most part, it's a fairly easy game. There's a lot of cheap one-hit kills, so when you learn to avoid them, it's, it's more playable. If you don't keep progressing upwards, or if you don't keep moving, it'll rain bombs on you, which will kill you. And of course, don't forget the continue code ABBA, which you probably won't need until the end boss. Once you get good at the game, he's super cheap and has one-hit kills. As you're running around shooting everything and admiring these super bizarre backgrounds, hitting the select button will allow you to switch between weapons and also select which items that you'll use. You activate the items by throwing a grenade. Something about the end bosses reminds me of another one of my favorite NES games, Blaster Master. Ikari Warriors 2 isn't terribly difficult to find, it's not super overpriced or anything. And like the original game, you can also play two-player on screen at the same time. It is a bit jerky though, although still highly recommended for your NES. And I've got a classic game room shout out and thank you to send to Jeremy from Beulah, North Dakota. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for sending one of my favorite games from many, many years ago. Which I must have sold many, many years ago. <laughs> This one has its moments, provided you don't spend too much for it, I'll highly recommend Ikari Warriors 2 Victory Road for your Nintendo Entertainment System. Time to relive the 80s with Operation Wolf for the Nintendo Entertainment System. A 1989 release based on the 1987 Taito arcade game. The awesome one with two Uzis where you would shoot all of the bad guys and probably a lot of the nurses by accident. 
As you can see on screen, this is a light gun shooting game for the NES that works with the NES Zapper and one of the game pads. The Zapper is your machine gun and the game pad will launch grenades since the Zapper only has one button. The one that counts, the trigger. Dude, it's Operation Wolf. What a great name for a video game. It also had a fantastic, upright, colorful arcade cabinet with guns. And sadly, this game just doesn't capture it because the Zapper does not compare to the amazing detail on the Uzis that were built into the Operation Wolf arcade machine. That game made you feel like Rambo more than any other game from the era, even the Rambo games. Like, uh, you know how light gun games now, or at least in the 2000s, all have bright, colorful, plasticky guns? Well, the Uzis on Operation Wolf were real Uzis. Or at least they looked like them. And if I'm not mistaken, they also fired like machine guns. It's been a while since I've played it, though. The problem with the NES version is that it lacks the awesome guns on that arcade machine, and you're constantly squeezing the trigger to the point where your finger will give out way before you do. Like, this game on the NES was really cool back in the day because it was a huge departure from Duck Hunt, that's for sure. And it was Operation Wolf. These days, it's probably best left in your memory. Not that it's unplayable, it's just a little rough around the edges. It's an old game. It's a shooting game on the NES. It's uh, hard as nails, but if you're used to playing light gun games on the Saturn or the Dreamcast, this will seem very rudimentary. But not without its merits, because it does put up a fight. Your objective is simple. Shoot everything. Even if you're not supposed to shoot it. Shoot it anyway. Teach them a lesson. That's for walking onto my battlefield. The arcade machine was a two-player game. Annoyingly, this is only a one-player game which takes some of the fun away. Why is it my fault that she got in the way of my bullets? Get off the battlefield! Why am I penalized for that? But if you like a good old school challenging light gun game or had this one as a kid and would like to revisit Operation Wolf, then maybe it's worth hunting down that game cartridge. Although I think you'll find it's Better for nostalgia than actual gameplay these days. Now the arcade machine, on the other hand, that's a keeper. As with all of the older gun or zapper games on the NES, Genesis, and other old school game consoles, you will want a CRT television to play them. They do not work on modern LCD plasma screens or projectors. We shall persevere. So if you have the antique technology and a NES zapper, then you are ready for Operation Wolf on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Although I would still recommend finding somebody, somewhere, someplace that has the actual arcade machine because man, it was awesome. <laughs> It's Knight Rider for the NES from 1988. Ah, the 80s. Back when things were so simple and so good, men could have big hair and wear tight acid-washed jeans in a non-ironic fashion. Good guys fought bad guys with a talking Trans Am and hooked up with a different babe each episode. Knight Rider was one of the best 80s action TV shows. Does it make for a great Nintendo Entertainment System game? You know, it's not as bad as it could be. A few of these 80s shows got turned into NES games like Airwolf. That one was pretty disappointing, but, uh, you know, it's Airwolf. Airwolf was amazing. It, it, it's hard to capture the glory of Airwolf in a video game. 
Airwolf is a supersonic helicopter piloted by Ernest Borgnine and Jan Michael Vincent, and while it loses points for Jan Michael Vincent, it gets double points for Ernest Borgnine. Knight Rider is a talking Trans Am piloted by David Hasselhoff from Baywatch. So, technically, Airwolf comes out ahead. So the video game doesn't have quite as much to live up to. As, as cool as Kit is, it's the Hasselhoff part of that that's disappointing. I mean, Hasselhoff versus Ernest Borgnine? No, you, you don't even go there. Ernest Borgnine wins every time. Getting back to the game, Knight Rider on the NES is like a combination of Road Blasters, Chase HQ, and Red Racer all rolled into one in... A somewhat satisfying, me mediocre package. It's okay. This is actually not too bad, but it, it does get repetitive quickly. And sadly, the, mu the music is terrible, and, and they don't change the music for, for uh, each level. It's almost like they, uh, I don't know, half-assed on this game. Imagine that, a half-assed licensed game. But it's still kind of fun and kind of playable. If you like these old-school NES action driving games, and you like Knight Rider. I mean, who didn't like Knight Rider? Knight Rider was a great show. Kinda got upstaged by the A-Team, though. I mean, the A-Team had a van and a Corvette. There's been these long arguments, or what's the best 80s action TV show? See, this is back in the day for you, young for you youngsters. Back before we all had Netflix and, and Amazon and, you know, YouTube and could watch anything at any time, anywhere. People all seemed to watch the same TV shows. Like, we all watched the same shows at the same time. Back in the olden days, when TVs, you know, only had a couple channels. So everybody watched Knight Rider, and Dallas, and Magnum P.I. and the A-Team, and ALF, which actually did get turned into a video game. What was the best 80s action TV show? You see, I always have to go with Magnum P.I. in this one. And I don't believe Magnum was turned into a video game, and that, that's a shame, because imagine how cool that would be. It would be like a side-scrolling action game where Magnum has to fight crime and solve mysteries, but only after raiding Robin Master's wine cellar, making an ass out of Higgins, avoiding the dog, stealing the Ferrari, hanging out with Rick and TC at the bar, and luring Aaron Gray back to the estate for a night of intense tropical passion while watching The Fall Guy on Betamax. Aaron Gray. Hmm. Who, of course, was in my other favorite 80s TV show, Buck Rogers, but I think technically that might be 70s, since it's- and anyway, don't get me started. I could go all day in 80s TV shows. Knight Rider on the NES I can only take for maybe an hour. It's not to say it's bad, but it's, it's very repetitive, it's exactly what you would expect. You drive, don't shoot the blue vehicles, they penalize you. Shoot the red ones, avoid the bullets and dynamite, dodge the helicopters, watch your time and gas. This game is actually a bit tricky. It's a little harder than you might expect, especially at first before you level up Kit, which is insane because Kit should be leveled up all the way to begin with. This one has a password continue system. Make sure to collect all of the power-ups, especially the gas and shield. You'll need them. I love the different backgrounds. Did you notice how gloomy New York was? Did they ever make a video game out of the love boat? They should have. Anyway, Knight Rider. Not a bad game. Good TV show. Buck Rogers was better. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I've just flown the Magic El Camino up to the new intergalactic space arcade to bring you the review of Mario Brothers on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Which now features an El Camino. When everybody else in the room is talking about how great Super Mario Brothers is, I'm the one lone guy in the corner arguing for Mario Brothers, the 1983 Nintendo arcade classic. This is one of my favorite arcade games ever, a game I used to play relentlessly as a kid on my Atari 2600. That's right, youngsters. Back in the day, Nintendo allowed their games to be published on other people's game systems. 
like the Atari. And for what it's worth, this was a really good Atari game, but it's even better on the NES. As you might expect, we get full 8-bit glory here, Mario Brothers looks and plays great. Mario has been around for quite some time now, even though he was featured in Donkey Kong. This is, as far as I know, his first starring role. Also, it's the first time we get to play Luigi. We've also got the POW block, which will upend all of the creatures on the ground when hit. Unlike most of the Mario series that follows, like Super Mario Bros. Mario Kart, this game isn't quite as colorful or full of the personalities that we've come to know and love from Nintendo. It's more about the gameplay. But Mario Brothers is harder than it looks. It's brilliant. In some of the shots, it may look like the creatures are only half there. That's due to the interlacing, which frequently messes with recording. On an actual TV, LCD, or CRT, it looks good. Your objective in Mario Brothers is simple. To destroy the creatures coming out of the pipes, collect the coins, and score points. While there's not a timer on screen, if you hang around too long, fireballs won't come out and attack you. So it behooves you to eliminate the bad guys as quickly as possible. After every couple levels, you get to test your skill for some bonus points, which is a test of memorization and timing. Learn the best path and don't miss any of the jumps. Even though I did in this round, it, you just don't want to slow down. Try to try to go the same direction as much as possible. While this may not be filled with popular Mario series characters like Bowser and Yoshi, it is full of crabs, bugs, moving icicles, and, of course, turtles. You need to hit the bugs when they land, knock the crabs over twice, and make sure to collect their carcasses before they wake up, or else you'll get a nasty surprise. Here's a couple important tips. You'll want to use both sides of the screen when running, jumping, and avoiding enemies. You can't change directions after you've jumped, so be careful, and learn where the edges of those platforms are. It's not as obvious as it might appear at first, and of course you can knock your enemies one of three directions. And, now this is important, you'll be quizzed afterwards. An enemy cannot walk through another carcass or an icicle or a coin on screen, so they'll change directions. If played correctly, you can actually block some bad guys away from you. I think the best strategy is to, first and foremost, stay calm, get rid of as many enemies as possible early in the level before the fireballs come out and make life difficult, and use the POW block sparingly, only in emergencies. Even though I don't have much footage of it here, one of the real joys when playing Mario Brothers is playing with a friend. Give Luigi some screen time. Two-player simultaneous arcade gameplay. It's great. This game cartridge is readily available out there for the NES, but you can also find it for the Virtual Console. It's one of Nintendo's big games, and this copy was sent to the show by our good friend Mark in Brooklyn, New York. It's one of the Nintendo Arcade Series games, not what the NES is best known for, but there's a lot of great arcade games on the NES. Sadly, that level did not go as planned, but this is such a great game. It's one of the best Nintendo games that nobody ever talks about. Mario Brothers. Totally overshadowed by Super Mario Brothers and the rest of the series. Now, I've previously reviewed this game for the Atari 2600, 5200, and 7800. All of those versions are pretty good, but this one is the best console version I've played to date. So thank you once again to Mark from Brooklyn. It's Mario Brothers on the Nintendo Entertainment System. I'll leave you with some more gameplay here, and at the end, you'll notice what happens when you don't pay attention to which crab you've only hit once. And, uh, well, it's a great game. You'll love it. So in that split second when I'm in midair and realize what I've done, we all need to go real 
real slow motion like to complete the effect. Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of a game called Destination Earth Star on the NES. That's right, a game that could have easily been called Destination Trash Can. Let's take a look. You know what they say, if it's from a claim, it's got to be good. Destin- they, wait, they don't say that, do they? Huh, anyway, Destination Earth Star. I mean, it's better than LJN. Come on. This is a game that tries to combine two games into one and fails miserably at both of them, but succeeds in failing miserably at two things at once. So it's got that going for it. Let's take a look at what happens when someone tries to combine Star Raiders and Scramble. On the NES, you end up with a game that you just don't want to play. So, each time you begin a game of Destination Earth Star, you're aimlessly drifting through space as slowly as possible, listening to the same repetitive song over and over and over again. Look, there's a little map on the left side of the screen. The things that look like zeros are planets, just ignore them. But don't ignore the fake Imperial Shuttlecraft. Blow them up for impersonating Imperial Shuttlecraft. When I was going to the Tashi Station to pick a pen- No, you weren't. Don't lie to me. Imagine floating through space for all eternity, listening to this music. Please turn off the music, Hal. Nope, I'm sorry. I can't do that. After you've successfully eliminated the imposters, the enemy base appears in the middle of the map and you fly there to experience the next part of Destination Earth Star. The part where you'll probably die. It, it, it's like a Transformer. The game is now a side-scrolling spaceship shooter, but not a very good one. I'm making fun of this without mercy, but it's like they missed the obvious things wrong with this game, like the developers never played it. Conceptually, it's pretty cool, right? You fly around space, explore worlds, some of them refill your ammo or lasers or whatever. You blow up a bunch of bad guys and then make your way to a cool side-scrolling spaceship shooter, right? Well, wrong. When it's all done poorly, the space exploration part of the game is way too slow and the combat is incredibly easy. So if you can fight your way through boredom to make it to the enemy base, you'll quickly find that the spaceship shooter sequence is damn near impossible. This is just the first level, which I memorized. The enemies attack you from all directions, so you're flying through the caverns, the, the enemies will crash right into you, you can't touch the walls or you explode, and then they'll attack you from behind. Which all seems really intense after you've just been floating through the depths of space for the past 5 or 10 minutes. And to make matters worse, if you are destroyed, you can't continue. So in order to play it again, you have to make your way through the boring space part of the game. Wake up! Come on, stay with me. Stay with me. We're almost there. I like the idea behind Destination Earth Star, but the execution is terrible after we destroy this ridiculous end boss. It's time to fly through space once again, fighting a few more enemies, but it's no more challenging. Until the next base scene, which killed me in like five seconds, and I would have tried it again except there's no continue, and I'm not about to go fly my way through space again. Not when there's nothing interesting to do, except maybe reading the manual. The manual's great. 
The game is terrible, but they put a lot of time into the packaging and instruction manual. Let's read the story. The time has come to return home. You've never actually been there. So how, never mind. It's been eons since anyone from your long lineage of humans has actually been there. Then how's it act? Never mind. But the image of Earth has always been kept alive by the elders. Those cursed elders. You've heard stories about it. And your race still performs the music from it. Ah, the music with an exclamation point. This is already better than the game. Even the Kojans, the Kojans, seem to take on human-like qualities when they hear the music. Hopefully not the music from the game, because it's not very good. The Kojans are the ones who kidnapped an entire ship full of Earthlings. Not just humans, but canines, bovines, and do domestic robotines, too. Ro domestic robotines. <laughs> that was centuries ago, when the Kojan Empire was younger, wilder, and less civilized. It was. Well, they sound pretty awesome. <laughs> Can I join them? Doesn't this spaceship come with any other music? What about the music from the elders? Or aren't these people all about their music? Why is it it's so terrible? I want to change the radio station, but I can't. However, I can stop playing it, so that's good. And y you know what I've said before, the worst games sometimes make for the most interesting reviews. It's fascinating. Destination Earth Star, two games into one, both of them terrible, but I'm glad I played it because now I know about the Kojans and whatever. I've got a classic game room shout out and thank you going to Eric from Gilbert, Arizona. Thank you for sending Destination Earth Star to the show. And that Atari Pro Wrestling game, I'll be reviewing that soon. Great packaging on this one, I love the box art and the instruction manual. Not so sure about the game, but this review was fun to make, so thanks again. <laughs> no. It was part of the their attempt to collect the highest species from all eight mega star systems. Don't play the game, just read this. At first, the Kojans displayed the living spoils of their astral journeys in open zoo-like cages. Eventually, the Earth's humans, along with species from other star systems, keeps going. Uh, uh, they were incorporated into the Kojan socio-structure as slaves. Finally, as the centuries passed and the Kojans became more mellow and more refined, Non-natives were given the same rights and privileges that the Kojans themselves enjoyed. Got better move along here. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Okay, they're going to send a representative back to Earth. That person must be a full-blooded Earthling. Strong, intelligent, personable, just like you. And uh, he has to make a good impression. Oh, no, sorry, no ladies. He has to make a good first impression on the ancestors of Earth, 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 if they still exist. Well, why wouldn't you send some hot robot girls? I didn't just say that out loud. Furthermore, he must know how to fly spaceship. Oh my gosh, this keeps getting better. Furthermore, he must know how to fly spaceship Earth. Am I reading this? He must know how to fly spaceship Earth ship. Spaceship. Uh, well, as you may have now guessed, it is you who has been chosen to journey to Earth, provided you're not a girl, to battle the terrestrial terrorists along the way, to return after all these years to the place of your origins, even though you've never been there, to say they say you can never go home again, but then again, they don't know how long you've waited. I don't want to go home. I don't want to play this game. I'm going to go do something else. Mm. 
This is the excellent Star Soldier, all the way from 1988 for your Nintendo Entertainment System. An old school hard as nails vertical scrolling spaceship shooter. And if possible, I'll recommend that you play this one with a controller that has turbo fire, or else you'll be exercising your thumbs. You only have one weapon in Star Soldier, your laser beams, and you can upgrade them to a point, which I'll show you in a bit, but like other old school vertical scrolling spaceship shooters such as Xevious, you are woefully underpowered for the majority of the game and must rely on movement and precision aiming. However, if you can pick up three of those power things, you get the Star Soldier Disco theme, Spread Shot, and Shield. I'm using the turbo fire on my controller to save my thumbs. Some of the enemies that you'll encounter look kind of weird, like this guy. And you can't lock onto him and shoot him with homing missiles, even though this is the future and you're in space. We're going to machine gun him. Like other old school games in this genre, like Truxton, Star Soldier is super challenging because it's really easy to crash into things. And note that my spread shot went down to a twin shot now, because I actually took fire from that weird blue face guy. Absorbed it with my super shield, but lost my awesome spread shot. However, I still have my shield, which, uh, which is good. Doesn't help when you run into things, though. Okay, we're going to attack the star brain, and if you don't blow him up in time, the game rewinds you back to the middle of the previous level and makes you do it again. So it's actually not a bad way to get some more points, but ideally you just want to blow away that stupid star brain. The way that I like to play Star Soldier is to get the spread shot, hang out in the middle of the screen and not move much. That way there's less chance of crashing into things. And let's get both of them at once for the bonus! Thank you! That's not easy to do because I usually lose the spread shot at some point during that level. <laughs> Alright, back to the star brain and a sloppy mistake, destroying my multi-trillion dollar spaceship. Damn it. Star Soldier is pretty easy to find for the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's actually from Hudson Soft. There are some sequels, including the well-known Super Star Soldier for the TurboGrafx-16. Both Star Soldier and Super Star Soldier are available on Nintendo's Virtual Console for the Wii. Here's another one of my games. Star Soldier is the kind of game where you increase the speed of your spaceship as you power it up. And then when you're destroyed, it goes back to being slow again, and completely throws off, at least my game. Visually, Star Soldier is not the most exciting game out there, but most of the old school Nintendo spaceship shooters all kind of look like this. Visually, in the gameplay department, Star Soldier is one of the better ones. And if you enjoy others like Xevious and Alpha Mission, then you'll probably enjoy Star Soldier. And I can't stand these stupid blue homing things that I'm about to get destroyed by when your ship gets the uh, slow speed option. <laughs> You're doomed. It's Star Soldier for the Nintendo Entertainment System. How can you go wrong with a hockey game that has a spaceship shooter right in the middle of it? As well as advertisements for Contra and Jackal. You can't. You can't go wrong. It's the iconic Blades of Steel for the Nintendo Entertainment System from Konami 1988. Blades of Steel.
Few games fragmented the NES audience back in the day like Blades of Steel. Were you a fan of ice hockey on the NES or the more stylish Blades of Steel? Konami games were, after all, known for their sharp graphics and awesome music. I like that in the Nintendo-produced ice hockey you can design your own team, but Blades of Steel looks cooler and has a better name, Blades of Steel. Sounds like a movie that should have a robotic Steven Seagal kicking ass using blades made of steel. Gameplay between ice hockey and Blades of Steel is remarkably similar and really comes down to one thing. Are you able to play defense while also controlling your goalie at the same time? You can choose to focus on your goalie or the defense. Unfortunately, if you're playing the goalie, your defense will not help out in any way, shape, or form. It's like they're distracted by girls in the crowd or something. They're literally useless. Offensively, Blades of Steel makes a bit more sense. As you've probably noticed, there's a little arrow that moves back and forth and indicates where your shot will be fired, so passing and setting up plays to attempt to score is futile. There we go. Playing against the computer, you just fire randomly and hope that it goes in. Go Toronto! But they're not the Maple Leaves. There's no NHL licensing in this game. Even though there's a couple teams to play as and a tournament mode, the strength of Blades of Steel is playing against another human being. Because then the limitations of the game actually add to the fun. And the music is just awesome. If you had this game back in the day, it will bring back memories. Yeah, the fun thing about playing against other people is that you know that your enemy sitting on the couch next to you is either concentrating on the goalie or the defense. And it's your job to exploit that weakness. I'm playing my friend Dave here, Go Pens, and we're both attempting to shoot while we think the other person is concentrating on the defense and not the goalie. Because if you're just staring at your goalie, you can stop shots fairly easily, but then you'll never play offense. Because your defense will certainly not actually attempt to get the puck. They just accidentally end up with it occasionally. When you play a friend, you end up with some pretty high-scoring games, which is great. But another limitation to this game is passing. You think you might pass to the guy that you're aiming at, but you don't. You pass to your closest player, which means scoring on yourself is extremely easy. It wouldn't be hockey without fighting, and Blades of Steel has got that too. They just drag the body off the ice and play resumes, no penalties. That's exactly what they should do in real hockey. And there's no offsides in this game either, which makes it even better. It's Blades of Steel, one of the best sports games on the Nintendo. It's also really easy to find these days and affordable. We ended up with a tie game here. Time for a shootout. Who's that guy that keeps whistling in the crowd? He's really irritating. He never stops whistling either. Even after 20 years, you think you'd get tired of whistling. Hey, that's a sound from Contra in Blades of Steel, or is it a sound from Blades of Steel in Contra? And I won! Four to three. Wasn't the score six to six? Oh well, all that matters is I won. And have bragging rights forever. Hey Konami, it's time to make another one. It's not just ice hockey. It's Blades of Steel.
Tengen presents Atari's 1988 arcade game Vindicators for the Nintendo Entertainment System. A very fun game. A very cool game. If you like Akari Warriors, I think that you'll enjoy Vindicators because it plays in a very similar fashion. But instead of playing as a dude with a machine gun and bandana, you're playing as a little tank. But you can't strafe. You can only fire in the direction that you're driving. And that makes Vindicators pretty tough. Also, your tank, unlike guys with bandanas, can run out of fuel. Which makes me question why you're driving a tank in the first place. A bandana seems far more stylish and efficient, but whatever. Tanks are cool. I like tanks. Does seem strange you can't rotate your turret, though. This is a one or two player game playing single player here. Invite a friend, play two players simultaneously, crushing enemies together, collect power-ups and stars to buy new upgrades like increased shot strength and projectile distance. Vindicators is a fairly compartmentalized game. You drive your way through these levels and like something out of Smash TV, you escape the confines of this studio-like environment to customize your tank. Keep an eye on your fuel gauge, by the way. Very important. If you run out of fuel, it gives you a few seconds and then you explode and die. And that's bad for you. Also, keep an eye on your shield down there on the bottom left. Can't take too many enemy shots. Vindicators starts off easy but gets insanely difficult quickly when you approach the first boss battle because your little tank isn't very powered up yet. My recommendation is to spend your stars first on shot range and shot power while also keeping an eye on your shield and fuel gauge. It doesn't really matter how fast your tank is in this game. You need to get through levels quickly, but, but not that quickly. Maneuverability really doesn't do you much at all in Vindicators. At least not at first. You'll level up your speed anyway after you upgrade your firepower. At first, just concentrate on staying alive and increase your shot strength and range. You'll thank me later, because the pesky enemies in this game do more damage than, than you might think. And if you can hit them at a distance, that's really useful. While the music is a bit repetitive, I like the cheerful style of, of Vindicators. Th this is a likable game. It's not a great game, it's just a likable game and a fun game. Make sure to destroy everything in each level, by the way. Especially the gun turrets, because as the game progresses, it starts to hide the keys that you need to escape each level under gun turrets. So you may start a level, and there's a gun behind you, you think you can just drive away and ignore it? No! There could be a key lurking beneath it. Warrior needs key badly. I'm gonna start talking in my Kylo Ren voice. Nobody understands me and how much I like Truxton. It's a disease. A very good disease. Pick up all the green power-ups. The F is fuel. Of course, you need fuel to survive. The things that look like headphones are really important because those are bombs. Now, don't use any bombs ever until you get to a boss battle. Because the boss battles are just cheap and dirty in this game. I'm using the NES Advantage, of course, because that's how I roll. That's how you should roll, too. That's how everybody should roll with the NES Advantage. You can wear that thing as a necktie as evidenced in my uh, Grand Prix review for the Atari. Anyway. Save your bombs for the boss battles, and then just rapid fire bombs into the enemies. That's pretty much the only way you can actually get through the boss battles. If you try to, like, avoid the enemy fire and, and I, I don't know, play properly, you, you die every time, or at least I did. Stockpile your bombs, unleash them all at once. Boss battles 
will kill you instantly if you get within range. And, of course, I've got a classic game room. Shout out and thank you going to my man Mark from East Meadow once again. East Meadow, New York. I have this stack of NES and Famicom games here. Mark's got great taste in games. This Mark also has great taste in, in games. I, I hope that all Marks enjoy games with spaceships and dudes with bandanas and machine guns and little tanks. Vindicators is a fun game. Recommended for your Nintendo Entertainment System. I also have good taste in video games. Is that so, Kylo? What, what's your, what's your favorite? Stop looking mopey. What's your favorite game? I like Tetris. Go away. Pinball for the Nintendo Entertainment System predates Nintendo's exploitation of Mario on everything because even though Mario is in this game, it's just called Pinball. Now it would be called Mario Pinball. But at least he's featured on the game cartridge, so he's not completely left out. This must have been made prior to the 1985 release of the NES in North America, and it may be the best pinball video game that I've ever played from that era. Is pretty much stomps on anything that was available for the Atari 2600, although Midnight Magic is a much cooler title. There's one table and two modes of gameplay, slow and fast. The thing is, it just works really well. You can actually aim your shots. Even though you can't apply pressure to the flippers like you sort of can in real pinball, after spending time with this, it feels like you're playing a real pinball game, as much as it can on an old-school 8-bit video game console. It's a split-level pinball machine, like uh, Solar Fire, for example, which means that if you can just keep the ball on the top level, you can rack up crazy points and not worry about losing it. But most of the really cool things take place on the bottom level. This game was loaned to me by Bowen, who presents the CGR pinball videos. In real life, he's one of the best pinball players on Earth, and defeated me barely, just barely, and Solar Fire one-handed. Fortunately, pinball for the NES has a two-player mode, so I can challenge Bowen to video game pinball and see if his skills apply. All the way, he was disqualified from that Solar Fire game, wasn't he? Most of the really old school game consoles had pinball games, even the Vectrex. And most of them played on one screen, so it didn't have a split level playing field, and had a few pinball like things, such as bumpers and targets to hit. And that's about it. Nintendo Pinball, on the other hand, has a lot of things to do. And that's what makes the game really fun. I could easily go back and play this one again and again and again. The key that I found to getting a big score in this game is just to keep the ball going through that thousand point slot at the top, if you can get it up there. That's uh, kind of tricky to do, and once the ball is in the lower screen, you want to shoot it up into the top right to start the Mario mini game, which then moves you up to the top level, which I haven't had much luck in doing this game. I'm playing this on the faster speed, and as you can see, the game is quite responsive given its age. It's always fun to activate the seals. Let's kick the ball into the bonus stage, which is way harder than it looks. The key here is just to keep the ball alive. Which I failed to do there, but at least it kicks the ball out onto the top playing field. Sadly, this wasn't my best game, but it showed a variety of the things that take place in Mario. I'm sorry, not, it's not Mario Pinball. It would be now, though. It's just pinball.
If you can pull off your breakout bingo stunts, you can drop the princess or girlfriend or whoever that is out of her confinement. Except I missed her. Sorry. I'm here to play pinball, not save damsels in distress. It's pinball for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Highly recommended. And really cheap and easy to find. Worthy of a re-release if you ask me. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Dragon Spirit, the new legend for Nintendo Entertainment System. Dragons shooting fire lasers, you can't go wrong. Let's begin with some storytelling. You'll all be quizzed after the show, so take notes. Here's what's going on. This is why you're fighting. Amru and Arisha married and had twins who were giant fans of Xevious and made this game featuring a blue dragon and explodey things. There you go. By the power of Xevious, I will slay thee. Give me blue dragon beyond blue dragon. You know what this game could use? More blue dragon. Nah, it actually has quite enough of that. It's got a lot of good things. I've always considered the original 1987 dragon spirit to be like Xevious with dragons, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. From Namco, you fly around and shoot enemies while also bombing ground targets. Sound familiar? Yes. It's similar to Namco's Xevious, except with a whole lot of additional things added like weapon power-ups and kick-ass dragons. With the addition of some really badass music, Dragon Spirit is a chaotic game to say the least. There's a lot of things going on on screen at once. And even though Dragon Spirit the new legend is supposed to be a sequel, I think. I would just consider it the NES version of Dragon Spirit simplified to actually make it playable on the 8-bit NES, which it is. It's a great game. Not as good as the original, but if you watch one of the CGR reviews of Dragon Spirit, it's on the PlayStation 3, you'll see how chaotic that game is. Soothing music and 8-bit babes with green hair. What's not to like? How about a lava level? We've also got a forest level, desert level, and ice level. It's like Contra with dragons. Sort of, but actually not at all. The gameplay here is pretty standard for the genre. You're shooting airborne targets and bombing ground targets, all for points. It's a vertical scrolling arcade style shooter. Keep an eye out for weapon power-ups, but be careful which ones you choose because you can easily go backwards. Weapons include super fire lasers, which is my favorite, and a traditional spread shot. Because what dragon is complete without multiple heads and a spread shot? As well as a pile of gold and a great case of beer, like Golden Drock. At the end of each colorful level, you'll encounter some end bosses, most of which aren't terribly challenging except for the angry tree thing, which seems to give me trouble each time I play the game. And uh, one thing I'm confused about is, occasionally I'll get pictures of people during the cutscenes, other times they're grayed out. I have no idea why. Is that a glitch or did I just do something different? I don't have the instructions, so I don't know. This is a 1990 release on the Nintendo Entertainment System, actually 1989 in Japan, and I think it's a pretty good looking game for an 8-bit vertical scrolling shooter. And I'm assuming that you've probably heard by now, the music is pretty good, too. Oh no, I've been blown up by the giant angry tree thing. When that happens, you get backed up to a checkpoint. Kind of like R-Type, or, well, Xevious.
Hooray! Yay! This forest was once peaceful, but now it's not, because peaceful forests make for boring video games. I've got a classic game room shout out and thank you to send to Paul from Valley Stream, New York. Thank you very much for Dragon Spirit, the new legend, which I'm happy to say is much better than Saved by the Bell, the new class. Dragon Spirit! I love the animation on the dragon, it looks really nice, and this level makes me feel like I'm playing Vanguard! Which is also nice, who doesn't like Vanguard? The little thing on the bottom left, the blue bar, is my health meter! I'm a dragon after all, I can withstand a couple shots. So thanks again, Paul. It's Dragon Spirit, the new legend, for your NES, a good vertical scrolling shooter with dragons. Recommend it if you can find it for a good price. Now's my favorite part of the game, where we bomb space walruses. Take that! Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Battletoads on the NES, one of the easiest games that you'll ever play. I beat this the first time I played it. Battletoads. Welcome to my review of Battletoads on the NES. I'm so glad that you've decided to join me for this delightful montage of cheap deaths and overall video game incompetence. Because this is one of the most challenging games ever created, and I'm not good at games, so... Let's all give a round of applause for the Game Genie. <laughs> Battletoads must have sold many a Game Genie over the years. Intro from Predator, anyone? Anyone? Just a few weeks ago, I reviewed the Sega Genesis version of Battletoads, which I really enjoyed, and it's fun to compare the two versions of the game. The NES one is the original, which was released by Rare in 1991 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. And yes, this one is actually more challenging than the Sega Genesis version, but I think a lot of that has to do with the hit detection. But there's also more stuff trying to kill you in a game filled with things already trying to kill you. If you think you're good at games, give Battletoads a try. It will most likely put you in your place. It's a sheer test of will and memorization. As well as precise, absolutely precise timing. I can get through like six or seven levels of the Genesis version, the NES one, take that down to three. Primarily because I can't stock up on extra lives in the tunnel descent and the jet sled scene is way touchier. Basically, you just need to program this game to memory, but I love the music and style in Battletoads. I was inspired to play the game after getting the awesome Battletoads soundtrack on vinyl. And while it may not be one of the more famous NES era soundtracks, it's really good. And the NES version does have the pause music that everyone seems to like. It's, it's not my favorite song in the game though. I really like this one to rock out to while dying over and over and over and over and over again. Beyond just being challenging and incredibly frustrating, Battletoads is a massive game on the NES with a nice, diverse variety of levels and environments and gameplay styles. You've got everything from platforming to racing, to old-school beat-em-up style gameplay here. 
You can play two players simultaneously, good luck with that. Battletoads is the textbook definition of NES heart. In the days before games were just made long and relatively easy, they were made to be difficult. This came out at the tail end of the arcade era, so as you can see, you're scoring points along the way. Try to rack up as many as possible because you'll need the extra toads, or just use the Game Genie. I'm not good enough to play this game, but every now and then I hear from one of you that you beat Battle Toads on one credit. I feel like the universe should reward you in, in some way. Like Darth Vader shows up at your door with a trophy filled with beer and Christy Brinkley from 1980. Congratulations, you win at Battle Toads, you win at life. Tell me that doesn't sound like an awesome afternoon. Anyway, I've got a classic game room. Shout out and thank you going all the way to Ahmed from Springfield Gardens once again. Thank you for sending Battletoads for the NES to this show. Stylistically, I think Battletoads is spectacular and I respect the gameplay even if I'm no good at it whatsoever. You can easily find this one online. It'll still cost you a couple bucks, but it may be worth it if you're looking for something tough to rock on your NES. You can also find Battletoads on the Rare Replay collection. Show those pizza-eating turtles who's good at video games! At least up to level 2. Welcome to Classic Game Room for the review of Robocop on the NES. Part man, part machine, all game. Do not store Robocop in extreme temperatures. Do not immerse Robocop in water. Do not clean Robocop with benzene. That would be bad. Nobody punches RoboCop in the RoboBalls and lives. Thank you for your cooperation. It's RoboCop for the Nintendo Entertainment System from 1988 by Data East. Part man, part machine, all game. The future of law enforcement on the NES. Is it any good? Is it as good as the movie? Because as we all know, RoboCop is one of my all-time favorite films. It's a cinematic masterpiece on every level. It's brilliant. Does the game live up to the movie? No. But did you really expect it to be? I mean, there's no way they could have made an NES game in the 80s that captures the true majesty of RoboCop. There's not a single instance in this game where anyone does coke off a hooker, no one dips their fingers into a wine glass and snorts it, no one's arm gets blown off, nobody gets drenched in toxic waste and splattered all over the windshield. And most distressing of all, the I'd buy that for a dollar TV show is nowhere to be seen. Robocop. You know the world has gone insane when the news in Robocop seems like a good day. Never have we needed RoboCop more. The question is, do you need this game in your NES collection? Choose your 80s action movie, odds are there's a half-assed NES game based on it, like RoboCop, Predator, Total Recall, Lethal Weapon, even Platoon. Yes, there's a game based on Platoon. No, it's not very good. In fact, it's even worse than this. RoboCop on the NES is pretty average for this crappy licensed movie game genre. It's got great music, it has a nice style, but RoboCop really shouldn't have any trouble defeating a bunch of unarmed suburban teenagers. How are any of the enemies in this game a threat to him? RoboCop's biggest challenge is getting through levels before his time meter runs out, because RoboCop 
is very slow. Thankfully, there's Game Genie codes for this game because I have no patience for it. I really don't care for any of these mediocre side-scrollers anymore. They were kind of cool back in the day, but they're just straight memorization now. Also, Robocop the video game just focuses on the action in Robocop. It's an easy mistake to make, but Robocop is far more than just another 80s testosterone-fueled action film. It's the subtlety that makes Robocop so good. And that subtlety is completely missing from the game. Which really isn't surprising because there's no way they could have possibly captured it. Like the scene when he punches the guy out of the mayor's office window and he lands on the ground. Pay attention to the TV cameras. The directing in Robocop is brilliant. But he's a super likable character and numerous Robocop properties have been based on him like comic books, cartoons, a Robocop pinball machine, and many Robocop video games, none of which come close to the movie. Oddly enough, the Robocop pinball machine captures the spirit of Robocop more than anything else. I'm not sure how that's possible, but it is. But Mark, I'm collecting for the NES. Should I add Robocop to my shelf? Absolutely, if it's on Laserdisc. But I would pass on Robocop for the NES. I really would. It just doesn't come close. And it's not a great standalone game either. There's just way better side-scrolling action games on the Nintendo, like Contra, for example. Contra manages to capture the sweaty testosterone field style from the 80s, and it's a good game. To be fair, Robocop the video game does pay homage to the movie pretty well at times. The environments and backgrounds look good, especially the steel mill level, which looks like it comes straight out of Robocop without the toxic wastes in. And nobody gets punched in the throat either or thrown out of the back of a moving van. As you might expect, Ed 209 makes an appearance, as does the Cobra Assault Cannon, which has limited ammo, so you may want to save that for some of the boss battles. I like that Robocop on the NES exists, but no, it's not one of my favorites. In fact, I've been thinking about what the best 80s action movie inspired NES game is, and the only one that really comes to mind is Top Gun. I know that many of you enjoy these kinds of games. Personally, I just kept running out of time. Robocop is so slow. He needs his Ford Taurus. Robocop isn't a very long game, and it doesn't cost very much either. In fact, you might be able to buy that game for a dollar. Not me, though. I'm saving that money for another VHS copy of TJ Laser. Stay out of trouble, Robocop. Can you fly, Bobby? Can you fly? Oh, you're still here. Bitches leave. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room time where it's always a great time to drive over people with a tank on your NES or... Well, anywhere, really. It's Iron Tank for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Crunch. Destroy. Crush. From SNK, released in 1988, it's Iron Tank on the NES. I love historically accurate video games. Because not only are they fun, but we also learn things about history and the way it really was. <laughs> Quick, save that guy! I will help you get into the enemy's base and destroy their secret weapons. Bonus points for proper punctuation. You don't often see that in the 80s NES games. Iron Tank is a fun game, but it is nearly impossible. The first level here is deceiving. It makes you think that you stand a chance, but you don't. You stand no chance. You probably have a better chance of invading Normandy, t well, today. 
What I like about this game is that it's a lot like Ikari Warriors, but all about the tank. And that gives it a, a unique challenge, because you can fire directly in front of you with the machine guns. But you strafe with your tank turret. It takes some getting used to. Crush! 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 Whoa! Landmine! We'll go over here. You can't easily rotate your tank turret and shoot things, and that makes Iron Tank really, really challenging, as if the game wasn't already hard enough, as it is. This is from SNK in the 80s. They were sadistic bastards. Alright, see now here's where I equip all of my super special weapons. Because I'm going to whoop this end boss's ass. All too easy. Thankfully you can equip some advanced ammunition for your tank, which is what you just saw me do there. However, later in the game, there, there isn't enough of it. So may I suggest the Game Genie for this one? Because Iron Tank is a lot of fun, but beyond level 3 it's just impossible. You must have a budget tank because its turret doesn't have the range to hit anything. And then there's the super irritating radio, which you answer with the select button. You can't turn it off and it sounds like a 1980s alarm clock. The radio! I hate this radio. What? Stop calling me, just send a text message. Like, I know there's somebody that wants to tell me something, but I'm going to run into it anyway. Also, I've played this level many, many times, so. You can just shut off the volume. Another thing, don't get yourself surrounded. You can't rotate your tank turret very quickly. You want the question mark power up for that scene, which eliminates all enemies. Get it, 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 yes! That time I was not destroyed. Because I used skill. And by skill, I mean I just ran over people. Stop calling! Iron Tank is just simply unfair. But at the same time, it's also really likable, so I, I, I kind of enjoy this game. Let's put on uh, a little auto fire. The F, I think, stands for funky. And we're just gonna hammer this guy away when he starts moving. Alright, come on. There we go! Iron Tank! It's a tactical error. Think about how much more powerful this tank would be if it was made from wood grain, like an Atari 2600. Wood grain tank. Now that would be a game. STOP CALLING ME! Iron Tank is a fairly lengthy game. When you're destroyed, you get a password so that you can continue. However, you don't have any special weapons. You don't carry any of your special weapons over. And you really need them for the boss battles because you have no range and no power. Basically, your tank sucks. Take that one out, take that one out, get another E, come up here, and hammer this one until it dies! Yes! We have destroyed things and caused flashy, blinky stuff. Made it! Oddly enough, while recording the live footage, I actually had a pretty good game and got farther than I'd ever gotten before without cheating. I'm your friend! Good. Stay on the railroad. Go straight through the town. The enemy train is there. Shoot it! Good luck. You'll need it! No! What to take to defeat this monster? I think the trick is just to drive by everything as quickly as possible while giving the bad guys the finger and then backing over them with your tank. That's my pro tip for Iron, Iron Tank. Now this part's tricky. You gotta equip all of your long-range and powerful weapons, but then at the end, you're going to get ambushed. So you need a question mark, which answers every question with itself. Even though I had one or two good games in there, at some point I just gave up and went straight Game Genie, which is actually built into the Analog NT Mini, which I'm using to play this. 
So that's kind of handy. Sadly, there's no Game Genie code to turn off the radio. I'm not answering the stupid radio. Stop calling! However, I have a classic game room. Shout out and thank you going to Daniel from Palm Coast, Florida once again. Thank you, Daniel, for sending Iron Tank to the show. It's fun. It's impossible, but it is fun and very likable. If you enjoy the other SNK top-down run-and-gun shooters like Ikari Warriors, I think you should definitely check this out. It's pretty cheap and easy to find. Now's the part of the game where you die horribly. Oh god, this is not good. No! No! Quick! Stop calling me! I'd be doing much better if they would just stop calling. Alright, now I'm basically screwed. Um... Recommended, especially if you like crushing enemies as much as I do with a tank. Okay, now we need all of the special weapons equipped again. And we win! That went better than last time. Last time I just got blown up. Every time I run over one of them, I feel better. It's true. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcast from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room, where I have a very special review for all of you today. This is Probotector for the Nintendo Entertainment System, a game that many of you are familiar with, and many of you call Contra. Let's take a look, because it's great. Wait a second, what have you done with my meatheads? Why have they been replaced by Thexter in Probotector? from Konami for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Which is Contra, except instead of the oiled down, muscle bound mullet sporting meatheads, you play as one or two of the Veritech fighters from Robotech or Valkyries. Which isn't a bad thing, in fact I love the box art, I prefer the box art, but I kinda miss that late 80s cheesy style. And so does Mirius Valkyrie, oiled down machine gun toting bandana wearing meatheads. Now that's 80s. Robots are timeless and apparently a lot less offensive. Because this is the version of Contra that Europe was blessed with, and apparently New Zealand, which is where this copy came from. The Contra gameplay remains intact, but it would appear that most of the organic enemies have been replaced by robotic enemies. Because destroying machines doesn't mess up kids nearly as much as killing 8-bit cartoony video game guys. So I'm told, I played Contra as a kid and look at me now! Look what I've become! A horrible, terrible person. I'm totally fucked in the head because I grew up on Contra instead of Probotector. It's been a while since I've played this game, but I loved Contra as a kid. It was one of my favorite NES games. I beat it several times. And I don't even have it in my collection anymore to compare the two of them, but this one seems easier to me, but maybe I'm just m remembering... Rem remembering things wrong. See? See? My brain's damaged from years of Contra. I take no personal accountability for anything else that I've ever done to myself. I'm going to blame video games. Now there's several things that make Contra, or in this case, Probotector, an extremely memorable side-scrolling action platformer, because back in the day there were a lot of games like this. Most of them are pretty forgettable, but Contra is iconic because it's cool, whether you're playing as a meathead or a robot. <laughs> the 
Probotector or Contra is just insanely cool with great music, good action, good gameplay, and I think it's one of the better third-party NES games from back in the day. Based on Konami's arcade machine, this one just works really well and manages to do a lot on the NES. Every time you play Contra or <laughs> Probotector, the game's a little bit different, too. Well, the enemies will attack you from more or less the same spots. It's not always exactly the same like it is in a lot of games. So even seasoned veterans who have memorized every level and musical track will have to be quick on their feet. Make sure to pick up weapon power-ups. I prefer the spread shot for the entire game. And of course, one of the highlights of Probotector, or Contra, is playing two players simultaneously on screen with your friends. I just love this game, and I was really surprised to, to see Probotector, which I thought looked really cool to begin with, published by Mattel of all people, turned out to be Contra. And, for what it's worth, this is the PAL version of the game, which seems to play just fine on my off-brand NES, the FC Twin. So a huge, enormous classic game room. Thank you goes all the way to Robert in Auckland, New Zealand. Thank you, Robert, for sending Probotector to the show. I love the box art and the storyline on the back. In order to protect Earth and its people, two robots have been created named RD-008 and RC-011 to destroy the Galaxy of Apocalypse. I want to move to the Galaxy of Apocalypse. Where is that? Is that near Auckland? I really can't shower this game with enough praise. It's one of my favorite NES games right up there with Bionic Commando. It's Probotector for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Highly, highly recommended. Banished from Earth Classic Game Room broadcasts from the Intergalactic Space Arcade on its never-ending mission to review everything. Welcome to Classic Game Room. It's a new year and a great day to review Metroid on the Nintendo Entertainment System. Released in 1986, this iconic classic remains a favorite of millions around the world. Let's find out why. It's Metroid. Right? Yes, I'm holding up the correct game. Good. The ominous music still sounds good and brings back some memories. Let me tell you a story about the time a friend of mine down the street got his NES. And we spent a lot of time playing games like Super Mario Brothers. He eventually picked up a copy of Metroid, which was unlike any game I had ever played up to that point. It was basically Alien in video game form, and Alien was one of my favorite movies. Even back then, it scared the hell out of me. Metroid certainly pays its respects to Alien in many, many ways. Now, as I'm recording this in 2085, most of you watching have probably played this game or are at least familiar with it. Maybe it doesn't even seem all that special to you, but back in 1987 or 88 when this was new, it was revolutionary because, for starters, it did away with the scoring that was so common in most games coming out of the arcade era. Metroid isn't about getting a high score, it's about survival. It literally drops you off in the middle of this dark cavern surrounded by enemies with barely any health and a wimpy gun. You have no idea where to go. So obviously, you head left and pick up the thing that allows you to roll, which gives you access to the next area and a glimpse of this massive game in front of you, which was very, very uncommon back in the day, as was a password system or even the need for a password system. Most adventure games in the mid-80s were like Pitfall, 
games that cleverly made it seem like you were going somewhere, but really you were just going in circles and scoring big points. Metroid, on the other hand, is completely different. You are going somewhere, usually down into the depths of the unknown, and, and it's terrifying. There's no hope of earning some extra lives because you only have one. Plus the addition of a password save system. Which was an incredible pain in the ass to write down and then type back into the NES. They're really long codes. But I can't even remember how many days we would just run around in the darkness and maybe occasionally find one of the hidden passages or a missile or health upgrade. The game seemed endless at the time. And the music and the visuals were just downright creepy and really, really cool. This is the first time I've played Metroid since I was a kid, and the experience is completely different. Primarily because so much of this game ha has now become pop culture. You know what to expect when you play Metroid now. If you get stuck, a map is only a few button clicks away in the internet. But it's still really tough if you get killed. You'll lose most of your health when you respawn and have to find some place to grind and get it all back. Also, the boss battles are extremely challenging. I still love the level design and the art design and the character design in Metroid, but what really gets me is, is all the hidden stuff. How did we find this back in the day? It's hard to imagine how much more time we had back then. And games were expensive more than they are now. When I got a game, I played the hell out of it because it's like the only game I had for, for a long time. You couldn't just go into a store and pick up a pile of used games for 20 bucks back in the 80s. Unless they were Atari games, and nobody wanted those except me. That's actually where I got all my Atari games, on Super Sale. But NES games were not going on Super Sale, especially Metroid. In fact, this game still holds its value today. By now, there's been numerous sequels on pretty much every Nintendo game platform. It's one of the most popular video game franchises in existence, and you can easily pick up Metroid on the Virtual Console for Wii, Wii U, and 3DS. If you love classic games, you owe it to yourself to try and play your way through Metroid at least once. But where am I going with this flashback? Why am I talking about the past? Well, this game reminds me of the time when the NES suddenly became the game system that everyone had to have. And there's nothing I can compare it to today. There's no modern equivalent of the NES and what this did to to the world and all, all of my friends around me in 1986 or 87, when everybody else had an NES but me. You can freeze enemies, you can attack them by spinning, this has giant brains that shoot lasers at you, are you kidding me? There was nothing like this on the Atari 7800. And I love my Atari 7800. I think Metroid may have been the moment when I got really jealous and eventually talked my parents into an NES. But to be honest, I was never any good at it. In fact, I think my friend did most of the playing and I was rooting for him most of the time to defeat the enemies. Not surprising, considering how terrible I am at this game. I'm still bad at platformers. Yay, more health. For those of us who were kids in the 80s, just try to put yourself back in that in that time and remember how much more advanced the music and the visuals in Metroid were than just about everything else out at that time. You know what this game actually reminds me of is Thexter, one of my personal favorites. In Thexter, you're also exploring giant dark caverns filled with enemies, except you're a transforming robot, so you're really powerful. In Metroid, you're always outgunned. Always. Which is why exploration is so critical, you have to find all of the upgrades if you want to have any hope of defeating the bosses, which are insanely difficult. And the hidden stuff is well hidden, too. If you're playing without a map, it'll take hours and hours of shooting and rolling and just jumping into things to find stuff. If you're playing with a map, the game is far more straightforward, but... You know, back in the day, that just wasn't an option. I don't even remember if Nintendo Power ever published a map. I still remember that feeling of of reading it every month or whatever, hoping it had a map of Zelda or something. Like, please show me where the thing is, I'm stuck, there's no internet! Somebody invent the damn internet! 
And of course, nobody was going to let me call the uh, 900 number tip line or whatever that was. Ah, Metroid, you're still a great game. And I like this level a lot. Eyeballs encased in ice cubes. I mean, come on, this is good stuff. I've actually really enjoyed playing this again. It's frustrating at times, I'll give it that. The boss battles in particular are a real pain in the ass. And while the ending of Metroid is pretty well known by now, I mean, the, you know, the character has gone on to do many other things, and she's also married to Casey Munchkin. At the time, it was another one of those mind-shattering, life-altering kind of, kind of things. Like, what? You mean it's a girl? S sorry, I guess that was a spoiler. But how about this one? Ms. Pac-Man is a man. Stock up on health because you're about to get your ass kicked. It's Metroid on the NES, and you can also find this for pretty much everything else with a Nintendo logo. It's one of the all-time greats. Suit up and explore. Just don't forget your sports bra. <laughs> Blaster Master is probably my favorite game for the Nintendo Entertainment System. This is one that I've been waiting a long time to do a review of. Primarily because I needed to find the time to sit down and play it again. This is a long adventure game and it's a lot of fun. The graphics and the controls of this game are about the best on the Nintendo that I can think of. It's just very responsive. Everything is very intuitive. They give you a glimpse of the story at the beginning. Apparently your pet frog uh, falls down a hole and there's a bunch of mutants and radioactive stuff down there and you go after him and it's a very plausible story. There just happens to be the uh, your, your truck tank thing there, which, which has a name. Her name is Sophia the Third. A very sweet feminine name for a destructive tank-like thing. This game was pretty revolutionary in that it combined the side-scrolling adventure game with an overhead mode as well, where you where you hopped out of your Sophia, where you hopped out of Sophia and then ran into the doorway and uh, you'd go through these little overhead levels. That's where you get power-ups and missiles and the electro bolt for Sophia and fight the end bosses. As I mentioned before, the graphics in this game are outstanding for the Nintendo. The music is, is terrific. And the level design is memorable. I, I just remember this game and how much I liked this game when I was growing up. It wasn't a straightforward game like Contra or a Ninja Gaiden or some of those other games. And this one, you got to a certain point, and after each end boss, you would win a different device for Sophia. 
Uh, the the most memorable to me, at least, was the hovering device where you where your wheels turn into little jet things, and your and your truck would float around in the air. But the level design was pretty neat because there were areas that you couldn't go to until you got the next upgrade for your truck thing. I'm just not sure what to call it. I'll just call it your truck. And when you get to a certain point, I think it's level three, and you beat the end boss for level three, you then have to actually backtrack through all the levels back to level one, and we'll see that in a bit. All these old Nintendo games had uh, seemed to have these levels where there were where there were yellow and black caution lines. Uh, Ninja Gaiden being one I can think of recently. I just uh, just played. I guess that's the stereotypical factory sort of level. If you noticed there, I'm using the hover device because I couldn't get up onto that ledge before. So I beat the end boss, I got hover, I get up there and then you'll see that now that I'm backtracking through all the levels to get to level one. Where I have to use hover to then go straight up and get to level four. This game is a tremendous adventure and playing it 20-some years later, it's just as enjoyable as it was back in 1988 or 1989 whenever I played this for the first time. It has a great variety of enemies. The, the design is really nice. It's a very well-designed game. Every, every piece of it, every part of it is well-designed. The backgrounds are, are, are neat. The enemy, the enemy characters are neat. Your Sophia tank truck is, is very neat. So it's all in all a very pleasant game to look at. And quite memorable, I told a few people I was going to be reviewing Blaster Master, uh, people who aren't even big video gamers, and they, and they remember this game. As you progress further down into the depths, you see the pipes and the, and the water and the sewage. Really nice attention to detail. This is the kind of game, honestly, I would have expected to see on the Sega Genesis, not the Nintendo. Graphical limitations aside, it does seem like a good 16-bit action game. It has an interesting variety of end bosses. And your big-headed character has two weapons. He has a gun and grenades, which you can pretty much use simultaneously. When you beat the frog, you get a key. And that's how you get into the next level. I have nothing bad to say about this game whatsoever. The only criticism I could possibly give this game is that it doesn't have a password function to remember where you were. You have a couple continues, but they eventually run out. 
When I was a kid, I had a lot more time than I do now, so I was playing the game, I got to level 5, and couldn't quite remember how to beat the crab guy, and was going to keep going, but then I, I uh, had previous commitments where I had to walk the dog and do yard work. It's pretty sad when you grow up and you have to put yard work ahead of Blaster Master. I'm pretty sure there'll be a part two of this review when I can get some time to play the game again, now that I remember the levels. And we'll go through the rest of Blaster Master, because it's just a tremendous game, and if you haven't played it, you need to. Damn it! Get up and fight that crab, you bitch! 